Yes, there's good money because of screw worm damage. Today, good livestock need not be sacrificed here in the southeast because a way has been found to eliminate this insidious. Any warm-blooded animal is subject to screw worm attack. In wounds have been found in practically every kind of domestic and wild. Even poultry is vulnerable. Animals are often so badly affected they never fully recover. Some may become useless for meat or worthless as breeding stock. Screw worm infestations, if left untreated, can result in death. Calves that survive may be crippled with joint disease. How does an ugly mess like this ever get started? Very simply, too simply, many stations are due to man-made injuries or injuries man can prevent. Screw worms cannot eat through the unbroken skin of a healthy animal. Injuries such as scratches, cuts, or even insect bites are open invitations to disaster. A favorite place for depositing eggs is the navel of newborn animals, but any open wound can attract the female screwworm fly, and livestock are constantly exposed to cuts and scratches on brushy range. Here's how the pattern of infestation develops. The female fly deposits her eggs around the edges of wounds in shingled batches. The eggs develop into worm-like larvae. They feed in clusters, eat into live flesh, and form a pocket. When fully mature, they fall to the ground. There they burrow into the soil and the outer skin hardens to form pupae. A week or two later, the fly emerges. During cool weather, this pupal stage may last as long as two months. Within 10 days after the flies emerge, they mate and begin to lay eggs. As long as the weather is favorable for screw worm, this life cycle will continue indefinitely. Stockmen have been fighting this pest for more than 100 years. Actually, a screw worm infestation is not too difficult to diagnose or cure in the early stages. Bloody discharge, foul odor, and the larvae embedded full length as their mouth hooks tear into living flesh are the symptoms of a screw worm infestation. Smears developed by the United States Department of Agriculture are effective. So are some sprays. Hospital pastures or holding pens facilitate retreatment until wounds heal. Remedies are important, true. Prevention is even better. The habits of the flies in the United States were well known. They are active throughout the winter in subtropical areas, spreading northward each spring and summer. There, every year, they are killed out by the cold weather. The first screw worms to reach the southeast were traced to incoming shipments of infested cattle in 1933. Within a year, infestations broke out in 30 Georgia counties and 20 in Florida. They spread rapidly. By 1934, they reached as far as Lake Okeechobee. The next year, they were found all over the state. Florida's climate permitted survival through each succeeding winter. 
Thus, the screw worm also infested other parts of the southeast during warm weather. The Department of Agriculture has spent years searching for new and better ways to combat this destructive pest. The problem was met head on by scientific methods, trained personnel, and modern equipment. Screw worm flies were captured and carefully observed, singly and collectively. Their biology and behavior were probed. Mating and feeding habits were patiently studied. Records were kept of all experiments, and the entomologists compared their findings. Results were weighed and evaluated before each new test. Ideas were exchanged and theories developed in the search for a practical way to eliminate this pest. An entomologist of the Agricultural Research Service proposed, if a method of sexually sterilizing flies could be found, eradication is probable. Chemicals were tried and abandoned. But geneticists had accidentally sterilized fruit flies with x-rays. So, x-rays were tried on screw worms. And they worked. Later, x-rays were tried on screw worm pupae. Irradiation during this stage also made screw worm flies sterile. This was the first real breakthrough toward a new approach to insect eradication. It was no longer a theory. It had been scientifically proved. When the sterile male flies mated with native females, the eggs produced did not hatch. But x-rays were not practical. The process was too costly. The most significant step forward came when a much cheaper way was found to cause sterility. Expose the screw worm fly to nuclear energy, cobalt-60, gamma rays. Research had revealed that the female screw worm fly mates only once. This, plus other important facts, were gathered bit by bit until entomologists finally pinpointed their elusive target. They fitted all the pieces together and planned their campaign. To confirm the early scientific findings and check out the methods, operations first had to be tested in an isolated screw worm infested area, a place where everything could be kept under constant control. Through the cooperation of the Netherlands government, experiments were conducted on the 170 square mile island of Curaçao off the coast of Venezuela. Large numbers of sterile flies were systematically liberated over the island. These flies were prepared and shipped from the States. Within six months, the screw worm population on the island declined and finally was eradicated. Exhaustive studies near Orlando, Florida in 1957 indicated that the sterile fly technique could be used to eradicate screw worms from the southeast. Florida and the United States Department of Agriculture outlined an eradication plan and pooled their resources. The other southeastern states cooperated in the program. At Sebring, facilities and headquarters were established in the heart of the infested area. An airplane hangar was converted into a screw worm factory where 50 million screw worms were reared and processed every week on a 24 hour day, seven day a week schedule. The breeding stock produced over 100 million eggs a week. Eggs were weighed out in five gram lots to start the cultures. Ground meat and blood were mixed in the proper proportions 
to feed millions of young worms being reared in hundreds of large temperature controlled trays. The larvae consumed 40 tons of meat a week. In about six days, they matured and crawled from the trays. The larvae fell through a grated floor into funnel-shaped hoppers below. Dropping into trays of sand, larvae burrowed in to pupate just as they would on range or pasture. After several hours during which most of the larvae pupated, the trays were emptied into a machine which separated the sand from the larvae and pupae. Another part of the apparatus, consisting of a slowly moving screen, permitted the larvae to crawl through, separating them from the pupae, which remained on the belt. These larvae were put back in sand trays to pupate. Pupae collected at the end of the belt were stored in trays. After storage for about a week at controlled temperature and humidity, they were loaded into metal canisters, 18,000 at a time. Thus, the new weapon against the screw worm went into action. In the greatest single nuclear energy installation under the supervision of the United States Department of Agriculture, each day, millions of pupae were transformed into living exterminators. Eight thousand Rentkins of gamma rays penetrated each pupa. Truly, a thrilling example of the peacetime use of atomic energy. On and on they went, each group ready to conquer a troubled sector. Pupae were measured into boxes where within a few hours, fully developed flies burst from their pupil cases. The boxes were loaded onto planes, which were equipped with a special device designed to open the boxes and release the flies. Tactics called for massive aerial distribution. Almost half a million sterile flies were used in each mission close to 10 million a day, every day, every week, every month. In some areas, the sterile flies achieved their purpose rapidly. In other areas, the native population did not decline as desired. So the number of sterile flies was increased per square mile. Less dramatic but equally important was the methodical day after day field work on the ground. State and federal personnel repeatedly covered the infested region ranch by ranch. Countless ranchers were interviewed to keep track of what the screw worm was doing to livestock. To supplement this information, native flies caught in traps along with sterile flies were examined and their numbers recorded to determine the rate of decrease in the native population.
Through regular progress reports, ranchers were encouraged to about the decline of screwworm populations in our state. The personnel could find a single screwworm infested animal in the southeast. A scientific triumph shared by the livestock industry. To guard the area against accidental revide for screening livestock entering the area. At stations along the Mississippi River, livestock are inspected and treated when necessary to prevent entry of infested animals. As long as there are screw worms remaining in other parts of North and South America, the hazard of reinfestation remains. Protecting this investment is everybody's business. On the ranch and farm, stockmen must continue to help by frequently inspecting their animals and by complying with regulations pertaining to shipment of livestock. Ranchers are urged to report suspicious infestations, submitting specimens to state or federal authorities, because during the different stages of growth, only the trained scientist can distinguish the differences between the screw worm and the common blowfly larvae. It's a miraculous new technique, eliminating a costly pest. This scientific triumph must be protected by the safeguard needed to make...